every single time I take an audition, I treat it like I'm looking at it for the first time. I need to figure out what I'm gonna do on my own time to like make this really fast learning curve happen. I have interviewed a ton of bass players who've landed full-time orchestral auditions. So many, in fact, that I wrote a book about it. Links in the description below. I've learned so many great lessons about preparation and long-term progress from all these conversations, but I think the biggest takeaway for me is the grit and tenacity that it takes to actually land one of these coveted and highly selective jobs. So while my bass is still at Davies Hall and not in the corner, <laughs> I thought I'd bring you takeaways from two recent podcast guests to show you their long-term planning process, the setbacks that inevitably happen, and how, through force of will, perseverance, and tenacity, they handle those setbacks. Is around number 20 for you? or a, This or... was exactly 24. You, you almost have to get to that point after you get to 10 and 15 and 20 and it's just like okay clearly something's not gelling yet and it's a matter of like figuring out what it is and you know they, I, I mean there's just a whole a whole host of factors that we can that we can dig into in excruciating detail i started my first semester of undergrad as a graphic design major so i had taken music lessons in high school but i think i quit I like stopped, I like, I don't know, fired my teacher, canceled my teacher, <laughs> like my senior year of high school. I just, just I went to, I went to uh, BUTI. And then after that, I was like, wow, that was such a busy summer. I'm going to take a break for like two weeks. And I was like, hey, this break thing is awesome. So I just decided I think I'm done. Like that was fun. I'm like ready to do other things. So I started in graphic design. After a semester, the music professor there, Eric Hansen, kind of caught wind. I think I was playing in one of the orchestras or something, and he was like, you know, if you do music major, like, I'll be take it easy on you. You can still take other classes. We'll give you some scholarship. So he, like, really tempted me. And so I ended up deciding, okay, I'll study music, but I'm still going to do something else for grad school. So I was thinking like maybe go to business school or maybe something, really what I was thinking is something more sexy, makes a lot of money. And <laughs> like, little did I know that, you know, everyone thinks it's way sexier to be a musician. <laughs> but I didn't discover that till later. <laughs> so I was like trying to do internships and stuff. And it was so weird, my last my last semester of college, I was doing a capstone project. I was kind of researching kind of an intersection of my interest. How are orchestras uh, evolving to be more relevant to like modern audiences? And so what are groups doing like cool, innovative things? So San Francisco Soundbox was one of the groups I studied. I flew out here, went to a concert. There were some other things in New York. You know, there's tons of things happening in New York. So I was there. And I just remember, I don't know what happened, but it just like, I was walking down the street in Manhattan and it's just one of those aha moments. And I was like, wait, I don't think I'm like ready to have like a desk job. I like think I want to like keep trying with music. What would be, and maybe you did this for Omaha, I'm not sure, but like, what would be your like, just like optimal for you audition preparation strategy? Like when would you start thinking about that list, like let's say the list came out and and you, the audition you want to take was six months from now. Mm -hmm. Like how would you, how would you go from like uh, day one to like being on stage? Yeah, so um, I talk about at least, I think in, in part one, the thing that Rob Knopper breaks down in the audition hacker uh, formula thing that he's got going, which like honestly just I did I did the self study course a while ago back in like 2019 I think I think I mentioned that the last time we talked but I have no idea um but he sort of breaks it into three phases being the um the note learning phase the self recording phase and the mock audition phase and for me I think I sort of settled on um at least equal weight to all mm -hmm. um so like let's say it's 6 months away I would say two months for note learning, two months for recording, and two months for mock auditioning. 
and that timeline could be compressed into as little as three weeks or as much as, like you said, six months. Um, and then, you know, I'll sort of like micro manage myself on smaller time increments. Like if two months is the note learning phase, then it's like, okay, what in the next eight weeks am I going to do like this week, this week, this week, this week? Um, and it's, it's really just like finding what that endpoint is and working back to it. Um, like as a goal setting strategy, like, okay, I want to do well at this audition. What do I have to do backing up from that day in order to set myself up to at least have a chance or mm -hmm. like the best possible chance of success. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think if we're looking for like what the, what the, what the most impactful of those three for me is it's the later two it's it's self-recording and it's mock auditioning because i would wait until like i really knew it i really had it down and i was really feeling comfortable before i would even record myself because i don't know why but like i want to i so badly wanted to like set up to record and play it and listen back and be like yeah that's it mm -hmm. but it never works that way mm -hmm ever the second you hit record your body just like sort of has a little bit of a reaction because recording is so unnatural as a musician like we're just so used to playing and not having to worry about the red light or what it's going to sound like and so the first time i record any set of anything kind of sounds not like what i want almost every time and so then by doing that over and over and over again, it's like, okay, I'm starting to hear my inconsistencies, where I get nervous, why I get nervous, why do I tense up there? Why does my stroke sound like garbage today? Um, and then the same set of circumstances happens even when I take that to like playing for other people because a different set of like, you know, physical reactions happen when I go to play for other people. And so just the act of doing that and like, incessantly bugging my friends uh we actually formed a sort of like little symphony group in in the omaha symphony that um <laughs> we called it the we called it the good idea audition seminar and the reason why is because um we're in year two of our um sort of dei training and so i think our acronym is idea idea inclusion diversity equity and access, I believe, is the acronym. And so we agreed our first meeting was going to be after the idea thing. And my friend Nick said, good idea. I was like, well, that's the name of our audition committee. It's the good idea audition seminar. <laughs> um, and so it just became this little group of, uh, we had horn player, bassoonist, clarinetist, a couple violinists, another bass player, like uh, two extra bass players, actually, and just became this group that kept each other accountable. I was like, the only way this is going to happen is if I like get serious from the beginning. So at SFCM, I made a concerted effort to like organize groups of my classmates where we'd meet up weekly to do mock auditions for each other. And I tried to record myself regularly, like sometimes daily, and then listen to those recordings and make really specific notes and play for a lot of different professors, bass players and wind players and violinists and things so I think like yeah it is it was inspiring to have like a mentor and a model like Scott to know that this path could be done but there was definitely like some uh extra work that has to go in to make that trajectory happen Christian Hales who got one uh, principal base of Charleston I think he yep. played he it was really cool how he just took the bull by the horns and he just made his mission. He moved to San Francisco to do uh, his master's here at the conservatory. And from mm -hmm. the moment he got here, if I'm remembering him right, it was just his job was playing for every single person that would respond to him. And he learned the power of the university email address. He would like contact the cello professor and this and, and just play for everybody. And it yeah. was always uncomfortable, but it was always so beneficial. And I mm -hmm. think that's, that's one of those things, how easy it is to just like, you know, fall into the, the trap of, oh, I can do this all on my own as well.
Gives no, you can't. <laughs> that it is extremely rare to find somebody who that that's how it's worked out for. I just, I just, I can't. I haven't heard anybody recently who's. Just yeah, there. I mean, it it happens every once in a while where like you know a, uh, a student just graduated, you know, insert you know top ten university here, and takes like two or three auditions, boom, gets a job. But like, you know, the reality is for most of us that doesn't work that way. And so, you know, taking every available opportunity to improve is kind of kind of what you have to do, mm -hmm. especially when you start getting into, you know, 10, 15, 20 plus. It's like, OK, yeah, I'm not playing for people. I need to play. I need to play for people more. The great thing, like never underestimate the power of a dot edu email address because people will give you free lessons if you <laughs> have that. <laughs> Not so much anymore. Uh, but actually, generally, people, even now, are like, other musicians get it, and they have been so generous with their time. So at the beginning, it was like wading through molasses, like so emotionally painful to be like, okay, I'm going to email this person I've never talked to, but they do teach at my school, and just ask them, Will you give me some of your precious time that probably costs a couple hundred dollars an hour? <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, just explain, like, I'm trying to get ready for this audition. And anyway, I was surprised. If people don't want to, generally they just won't answer. But about half of the emails answered. And of those, like two thirds, we were able to set something up. And they were really gracious and gave really helpful feedback. I just remember, you know, playing for. Uh, Paul Welcomer, who's one of the trombone faculty and one of the plays in the symphony. And he had such interesting insight of like, well, if I'm on a committee, uh, this is what I'm listening for. And the reality is like, it's not just bass players on your committee. So hearing that type of feedback was a major, uh, yeah, a major plus for me in my, in my preparation. And the other thing about like it being a part-time job is it's totally true. I I feel like you got to become like part entrepreneur if you're going to make it work and like get used to the difference between me now and me a year ago is that like I'm just okay, more okay making an absolute fool of myself in front of people. I'm okay sending them emails that like maybe they may think are weird. I'm more okay like asking people for favors. I'm more okay going, scheduling a, to play for someone kind of early on in my prep when I don't have all the excerpts learned and sound bad in front of them. And I just take that in stride and like, well, this is part of the process, an important part of the process. If I just waited till I felt ready to play for them on everything, it would probably be too late because it'd be like three days before the audition. <laughs> so it's good. I'm just like, I think it's important to just get used to from the beginning stretching yourself and becoming more comfortable with that because then you can accelerate your growth if if we just lived in that fantasy world like what would a week of audition prep practice look like for you like what would you what would you do yeah. would you wake up monday morning uh or like how, what would that look like maybe yeah so so this actually happened to me last year sort of during i would say the months of july mm. Like I, I basically June, July, and the first part of August, um, leading up to the Charleston principal audition that that Christian won. I was in. Uh, I actually met him there. We were in, we were all in finals together, and they it took some time to deliberate. So we definitely commiserated out in the hallway <laughs> for probably a good 30, 35 minutes before they actually decided. But um, leading up to that audition, I mean the 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 good part of that audition is the list was not, you know unnecessarily long it was just like you know kind of meat and potato stuff that you would expect to see on on an audition for a principal job you know your your uh you know your concerto exposition a couple of or or orchestral solos and just like you know your beethoven your mozart your strauss mm -hmm. um just can you do all the things that we need you to do but um practice wise that was sort of one of the first times that i actually found a way to strike a work-life balance Hmm. And I, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think I just said that was one of the first times that worked out for me because I didn't have a whole lot else going on. And so I would essentially plan it out like an eight hour workday. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like nine to six or whatever, something like that with a break, a break in the middle for lunch. And when I was done, I was just done. 
And I wasn't used to that. Like I would, you know, have some other stuff to do during the day and then the afternoon, then I got to teach and then it gets to dinner time. And after dinner, it's like, well, I've only got a, I only got like an hour on the base. So I got to, you know, I got to practice and it's hard to have a social life. It's hard to take care of your house and keep things clean and keep food in the fridge. And, you know, but um, I think that sort of taught me that you can't overlook that. You know, it's so easy to get burned out. And I didn't, again, I did not take my own advice um, in the year following that audition, um, which I would say, I don't know if this is too much of a tangent from your initial question, but um, I actually felt extremely burned out at the audition I took right before Omaha. Mm. Um, I was actually in Fort Worth with with Sean. Um, I saw him right per, right before his his semifinal round, and like I was knocked out of semis again. I was in this phase where I just kept making semis but not finals regularly. And I'm back in my car, and you know I'm you know comfortable enough to admit that I that I cried in my car for a little bit. And I was that was the first time I felt like I didn't want to do this anymore. Like I thought I was done. I, I did not want to do it anymore because it just, it took too much and it hurt too much. And it felt like I'd been wasting the last like 10 years of my life. And so it was just like, okay, you know, it's like hometown hero audition coming up. It's not my hometown, but I've sort of made Omaha my home. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, if it doesn't work out after this, then maybe we'll think about what the next step is. Do I want to go back to school? Do I want to pivot to you know go go to coding boot camp and get a better job because i was tired of making 25k a year hustling five part-time jobs mm -hmm. um and uh you know we can talk more about how that whole process went but the moment that i found out that i won it was as though like these two ton weights that had been living on my shoulders for 10 years just lifted there's kind of two categories of what i'm working on one is like technical things and the other is just like your mojo. And the mojo cannot happen without discomfort. Like how are you gonna show up on the audition, walk on stage? The way I want to feel a successful audition for me is when I get on stage and I'm less nervous there than I was in the waiting room. And I get there and I'm like, I know I can play this music. I just have to do what I've done the last three weeks playing for people or two weeks or whatever. And, you know, sometimes it's like, I'm just excited to show this committee that I can play the excerpts better than some of them can. You know, that's kind of like the point you want to get to. And whether or not that's true, that certain attitude can certainly help you play your best. And, uh, but I think like that type of like, I'm ready and in a place where I feel safe enough to, really express what I can do. Uh, it takes a lot of like discomfort and like messing up in front of other people to get comfortable with that. And that's the part that I think like I'm always working on. At some point I say like, I'm not gonna change fingerings at this point, or I'm gonna try not to like obsess over like little micro bow movements or something. Like this is just, diminishing returns at this point but like the mojo thing it's like i try to get it. how do you burn out in general or just like how did you handle for better or worse those sort of like brutal uh success quasi success failure uh yeah problems? um so i have i just so you can help me remember i have two 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 segments of a response to this the okay. first being like more tailored to like what i like to do when i'm feeling burned out and then the second one, it might be useful to talk about what the last year, year and a half was like, mm -hmm. because I made, I think for me, the biggest push in taking auditions I ever did and I ever have in 2022. Um, and it was sort of like what I learned from each one. Mm -hmm. So the short one is the is more directly to your question of like, what do you do when you're feeling burned out? And yet again, we come back to taking my own advice that I give to my students. And like, if I wake up and it's like, okay, I, you know, it's time to practice. I got to do something, but I, just, I really don't want to. Um, I'll go with what I can't remember who, t who coined this term or who told it to me, but it's the five minute rule. 
Mm-hmm. Five minute rule being that, like, just get it out, get the bass out, tune it, and, you know, just do some warm up scales or long tones or something like that for five minutes. If after five minutes you still don't feel like playing, put it away. Don't do it today or try it again in a couple hours or later later tonight or whatever. Mm-hmm. But more often than not, I would get the bass out, I'd get it tuned, and I'd be playing long tones, and I'd be like, yeah, I like this. I really like this. I like I like the sound that I'm getting. I like I like what's happening right now. It's very cathartic and very I don't know, I just really like playing the bass. I don't know about you, but it's mm-hmm. it's it's pretty great. So more often than not, it would just be like, yeah, okay, I'm cool. Um and then I'd be in it and I'd get a couple of couple of productive hours in. But mm-hmm. every once in a while it'd be like, no, nah, I'm not gonna do it today. And uh taking a day off every once in a while is essential um honestly because it's really easy like uh like on a sunday where it's like you know i could practice all day today or it's a really nice day out today i could get lunch on a patio with a friend or grab a drink with somebody later or something like that and it's like that's actually better my first audition was like the second month of my master's program in the ballet sf ballet had an audition for just section it was actually for one year positions Mm -hmm. and I made it all the way to the super finals. And that was like, wow, I'm so glad I chose to do music. I can do this. And that was really important for me to just say like, you know what, you should keep trying. And uh, then COVID happened. So there was kind of a lull. After COVID, I took San Diego and Atlanta and then I think I I advanced in those just mm-hmm. to the semifinals. And then San Francisco did well in that one. That was exciting. And then, oh, I think right before San Francisco was uh, another ballet audition. And I like advanced in that one as well. And then San Francisco and then Charleston and like went all the way with Charleston. So it's only like seven, six. You've done a handful, did your, did your like prep process change there is a there is a very distinct moment where it like uh you can see the effects of it uh so i obviously did some of the things before i tried playing with some friends we would do mocks for each other uh but the ballet my first audition i don't know what happened it was like beginner's luck because then the next two auditions, I made it past the first round, but that was it. I couldn't get past the semifinals. And then I took the ballet audition again. Yeah, same thing. Semifinals, couldn't make it to the finals. Then the next one was San Francisco, and I went all the way to the finals. And San Francisco, it was like, that was like my dream job. And so I was like, well, if I really want this, how would I prepare if I had to win this job? So that was the time where I decided like, okay, I wrote down on a piece of paper, like what would I do if I really wanted to win this job? How would I act? And I decided like, okay, I would play 30 mocks for people in my preparation for this audition. And I would focus on fundamentals and I would like uh, do these certain exercises to like, I had some like kind of specific ideas of things that I knew I needed to work on. And uh, so I like kind of hit that list and of kind of that checklist of things to do. It's like, I did not do all of them. I think I had, I played 12 mocks or like mocks meaning like uh, playing for a professor or like in a, a master class for a visiting person or something like that. So, but 12 performance things on my list. And, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think what else I did for San Francisco. Oh, I just took the like week of physical prep pretty seriously. I made sure that I was like exercising, sleeping my daily could daily schedule. I started drinking Gatorade like three days before. Stay nice and hydrated. I carbo loaded. We had like pizza and pasta like the two days before, and then I had like spaghetti for breakfast the day of the audition. Whoa, <laughs> I was like, really? I gotta because the first the auditions I had just taken. I'd make it past the first round. By the time I get to the second round, I was like so exhausted that I found myself getting to a place where I was like, I don't really even care if I win this. I I really just want it to be over so I can like go back home. 
And I think that reflected in my playing. Like, no, all my dynamics, all my expression just sort of like came down a level. So with San Francisco, Simon James, the violin, one of the violin professors at SFCM, gave that advice to me when I played for him, was like, it's a really physical endurance event. You need to like treat that aspect seriously as well. So all of those things combined, San Francisco was like up to that point, the best audition I'd ever had, where I was the most nervous I felt was those like hour, two hours after you play and you have to wait for them to come give you the feedback. But on the stage, just like, a really shocking amount of clarity and just sort of like groundedness where I was like, I've done this audition in forms a s score of times before I got here. So I, I'm totally ready to do this. I think this, this is a really good segue into talking about like what 2022 was like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because, because like you said, uh, a, a, there were just so many auditions and it was, really easy and tempting to take as many as possible mm -hmm. and i did and in a lot of ways i'm really glad that i did because it like 2022 was the year i figured a bunch of stuff out mm -hmm. um so i think i think it was early like january was milwaukee that ultimately had i think four positions yeah um system principal in three section spots because you know like like a lot of orchestras, I think a lot of people who are around retirement age saw what happened to the pandemic. They're like, nah, I'm done. Like, I'm out of this. You guys have fun, but I'm, I'm going to chill for a while. Um, which I, I don't, I don't blame them in the slightest, honestly. Yeah. Um, so, so Milwaukee was interesting in that what that, what that taught me is that I need to be really, really comfortable with unpredictability in the audition schedule. Um, it, because I think it was over two days and first day I played at like nine in the morning and, and that was my prelim. I made semifinals. That was, I think my first time or my second time like advancing to semis in a live audition. Cause I'd had some success with some video auditions in the past, but never live. So it was like, okay, great. But the, the thing that got me there, and I don't, I don't fault the orchestra for this at all. This was, I think their first audition back from COVID, the first audition in their new symphony center in the Bradley symphony center. And so the, I mean, it was, it was a lot of figuring out for everybody. Like, how do, how do we do auditions again? Like, what is this? So uh, the unpredictability there was I was in a private warm up room by myself for almost two hours. Whoa. Uh, the, you know, the, the committee took a break and I wasn't aware of it. And I, I just sort of like stayed in my room and didn't really leave except to get water or go to the bathroom. And I didn't ask anybody in charge what was going on. And so what that taught me was that if you're ever unsure, go ask somebody. Like if you're, if you're like, man, they should have come to get me by now, go find the the person at the check-in desk and be like, Hey, just ch getting a vibe check. Like, are we on schedule right now? Are we pretty behind what's going on? And then they would have said, oh yeah, the committee decided to take a break. Uh, they'll start back up in 45 minutes and we'll get going there. And so that, that was, that was lesson number one. It was just like, understand that, it, that auditions can be unpredictable and just roll with the punches as they say. Um, what was the next one? I think the next one was Grant Park. Didn't advance at that one. I don't know if there was necessarily a lesson other than I need to be more organized in my preparation because there were a couple of excerpts that didn't quite get the same attention as the rest of them. And two of them were on the prelim and they didn't go so well. Um, I think Cincinnati was after that. And I, pr I only had two weeks after Grant Park or something like that. It's like, okay, I need more time than two weeks to prepare for an audition. Mm -hmm. Great, learned that. Um, Kansas City, uh, I think that was May, um, took that one, advanced to semifinals. And that was one where I first started, I talked about this in, I think, part one of my video where in the note learning phase, I have my sticky notes yeah. on the music. And one of them is for literally like, okay, let's say it's Mozart 35, fourth movement. I like it at maybe 120, 125. So I start the first day at 60 and I play it at 60 that day. I can play it more than once, but I play it at 60 that day. And the next day I see it, I play it at 63. You tick one tick up on a standard metronome. 
then the day after that was 66, et cetera, et cetera. And just by playing it at every tempo, um, I was just more confident in my presentation because I knew I, it was the, never a question of whether it was going to work in the audition. I knew it was going to work unless there was some other extenuating circumstance. So that audition, <laughs> I played probably, I think still to date, my best prelim of my life that day. Oh, wow. Like every single excerpt, like I walked out of the room, I was like, I advanced from that. That was the first time I felt that it was awesome. Advanced that. And then the, 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 the semifinal, I think there were like five excerpts on it. Four of them went perfectly. And the last one was Mozart 35, fourth movement. It's like kryptonite for me, man. <laughs> um, and I remember I played it and it was, it was a little slow. It was a little unclean. It wasn't what I thought. And I'm like shaking my head after I played it. And they, there was a pregnant pause behind the screen. And they said, could the candidate play that excerpt again, but a little bit faster and a little quieter. It was the, the snake leading into the recap. And, and, and so they said a little bit, a little bit faster, and a little bit quieter at the beginning. I'm like, great. It's my opportunity. I know how to do this. I can do this. This is my shot. This is make or break. I played it the exact same way again. Another pregnant pause. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, I think that one for me told me okay like even if you plan i'm an overthinker so even if you plan for every inevitability there's still the the human element like mm -hmm. you're going to be nervous mm -hmm. and so it's just a matter of like how to take that nervous energy and channel either channel it correctly or just like take the rapid heart rate and the fight or flight response and just kind of suppress it gently mm -hmm. um and that's something I talk about a little bit in part three as well. Oh, geez. What the heck happened after that? Charleston Principal made finals for the first time. Indianapolis was after that. And I hope this is okay that I'm just like oh, going through each yes. one. Okay. I okay. So, so I, what I learned from Indianapolis was that I need to be, for me, I need to be in control of as many variables as possible. Cause I took that audition with um, a friend of mine in the orchestra with uh, Nate Olson, he's principal and uh, love the fact that he's my new stand partner. <laughs> That's great. Really excited to share a stand with one of my best friends. Um, but we, we took a couple of auditions together and so we'd carpool out there. It's good to, you know, have some camaraderie. Mm -hmm. um, and we were staying at his relative's place about 30 minutes outside of town. And I think his round was at 11 in the morning and my round was at four. Mm. And so he was like, yeah, I could like drive in and play mine and come back and then take you for years because we took his car. I was like, no, you don't need to do that. We don't have to take two trips. I'll just go out with you, hang out. Like we'll get lunch after your round and I'll come back. And I came back around maybe 3.30 for my four o'clock check-in time, auditions running ahead. Oh, and they were like, Hey, we can get you into room right now. I was like, cool, great. And so I get into the room and I'm playing scales. And I kid you not, I think it was in that room for 10 minutes. Oh my goodness. The committee's ready for you now. I was not ready. Yeah. I think I bought myself an extra four minutes of like anxiety inducing, like, when are they going to come back time? Yeah. And that audition didn't go well didn't advance and so it's like okay okay i need to be a little more in control than i was that day and so then geez what happened after that i think there was a big long break until there was uh rochester third chair and there was toronto not long after that so i did a big i did a big boy northeast united states trip uh went to rochester and made finals there and then went and stayed with some of my family in New Jersey for about a week and then drove up to Toronto and took that one. That one, I don't know that there was really a lesson in that one that I learned. It was, I think it was more so like more along the lines of um, working to control nerves a little bit more because my prelim went really well. I wasn't nervous at all. The semi, I was nervous and it was, I'd say about 65% what I wanted it to be. 
And when they said thank you, I was like, yeah, that's probably that's probably not going to work. Um, but yeah, so so it, it it was sort of like a you know a little bit of a steady trajectory upwards, but with those, you know, little valleys here and there of like, didn't advance, this didn't work, but there was something to learn from each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fort Worth was the the only other one I took before Omaha. And um, actually, I know what that one was. Um, I hadn't really been keeping a good eye on the setup of my base. And so what I actually realized, and it's so funny that like little things that you do with your base every single day can have an impact on the setup. So I have a Meridian case on my, on my base and there are a couple of handles like close to the bridge, like where the bridge pocket sort of nestles in. And when I would put it into my car, I would use that handle to lift and move it in. And then I would use that handle to pull it out. And so over time, just little tiny bits at a time, my string length was lengthening. Oh, yeah. And so my base is usually right around or just ahead of 41 and a half. And after I took Fort Worth and I asked for feedback and they said, you know, intonation, little intonation, this wasn't super clean or confident, intonation. And I was like, huh, that's usually not this much of an issue for me. What the heck? And my string length was was longer than 41 and three quarters by that point. And it was just enough to throw things off for my left hand. And so it's like, okay, yeah, I need to take, uh, you know, I need to take Mike Shank's advice. And I need to use my Shank strings, string length tape. Nice. And make sure that make sure that the bridge isn't moving. Yeah because it changes the sound and the behavior of the bass too. So like I check my string length like probably once a week and just by not using that handle, it's fine. It stays right where it needs to. Wow. So just, you know, keeping an eye on the setup of your instrument. Uh, like I was talking to a friend the other day that they just noticed that like, you know, they, they were frustrated with their instrument because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't behaving correctly. It seemed like the A string wasn't responding the way it used to. And they actually finally took a good look at their bridge and it was starting to warp just a little Ooh, bit. Yeah. And so it's just like, that was, that was that was what I learned. It's just like, you know, this is a, almost like a living creature in some ways. Yeah. Like it has, it has a temperament and, you know, humidity control is important and, you know, just double checking for seam openings and bridge placement and all of that stuff, it's important. And that was what I learned from Fort Worth. Thankfully, I didn't decide I was out after that one feeling so burned out because it, it worked out for the Omaha edition. Um, since I'm on this tear, yeah, I'll yeah. talk about that audition and then Please. we can move on to like whatever whatever else you wanted to talk about today. Um, that audition, I was infinitely more scared of than so many others because there's a lot of added pressure of like, you know, it's an orchestra you belong to. It's a community you know. Everyone who's behind the screen is somebody that you know and have worked with and played with and are friends with on some level. And so you might think that that makes it easier, but it totally doesn't. Right. Um, and the people that I, you know, I knew, obviously, Nate's the principal base. He's going to be chairing the committee. And I knew Danny Meyer was also going to be on the committee. But, like, they were very good about... Um, you know, being impartial. And, as, uh, you know, I had played some of my Fort Worth stuff for them back, you know, a couple months before the audition, but they were like, after Fort Worth, we can't hear you anymore. Right. Like, we can't listen to you. We want to make sure that this isn't like, you know, that there's no implied or otherwise, like, you know, favoritism or something like that. So, and like, every time I would see people at work, they'd be like, you know, you're taking the audition, right? Like, yeah, they're like, oh, you'll get it. Oh. And it's just like, yeah, I mean, totally not a guarantee, man, but I appreciate the vote of confidence. Um, yeah. So so it was a lot of pressure. And since I'm a member of the orchestra, our CBA lets um, a current member uh, be pre-advanced to semifinals. And so you can either play a prelim or just start right in semis. And so I started in semis. And that semifinal run was probably the sweatiest round I've ever played. Like, I, like sweat, not literally, but like, 
I'm in I'm in the warm up room by myself and I can just feel my body just like like balled into a fist of anxiety. And uh, I think I think just like the the dedicated prep, the self recording, the incessant mock auditioning, like it came in really in handy for this one because I played my semifinal round and it felt terrible to me. It felt awful. And I asked to play one excerpt again. I was thinking it was the fourth movement of Mozart 39 because I didn't think it was clean. And I, I motioned to the proctor, asked to play it again. Proctor asked, could the candidate play that excerpt again? And there was a brief pause. And then I, I heard Nate say, okay. Because <laughs> at, talking to them after, they said, that was fine. Yeah, That went well. But it, to me, it felt like garbage. And so, you know, it comes back to this, this sort of like life lesson I picked up from somebody, a life music lesson of, um, you know, part of getting better at auditioning and performing is making your worst day sound like everybody else's best day. Mm -hmm. And that was not a good day for me, but it, and it felt like trash, yep. but it sounded good apparently because they advanced me to finals. And then that took a lot of a lot of weight off of me because it's like okay i i got through semis i'm in finals it's me and two other people and i saw who the other guys were and i was like okay even if this doesn't work out for me i'd be comfortable with either one of those guys um sitting in the title chair ahead of me mm -hmm. and so just by having that weight lifted i had a really good day of playing on my final it was the same day as the semi but like i just reset after after advancing to finals and a lot of people i mean we all we obviously talk about all the things you can do all the practicing strategies all the mock auditioning and their self-recording but at the end of the day the person who wins has a really good day in the san diego audition which was maybe uh, a couple months before san francisco uh, the, you know, personnel underling, she was like the intern or something, you know, her job was to like take me from my practice room to the stage. She just asked me like, so how are you feeling? Yeah. And I was just like, I'm so nervous. And she's like, but isn't this exciting? You get to go on stage and show the committee how well you can play this music. <laughs> and I think I remember feeling like that's great advice, but Maybe not for me at this audition. I don't feel there right now, but like I aspire to feel that way. And that, for some reason, like God bless her, wherever she is, she made a very deep impact on me because I've always remembered that. Like I want to get to the place where I'm excited to show the committee. And by the time I took, when I took Charleston, I, yeah, the, the sheet came down. Well, there's a couple moments. I just totally ripped my box solo. And I remember finishing and I looked over and the personnel person who's like sitting next to you, your little babysitter on stage, was just like nodding like, <laughs> nice. And uh, I, then the sheet came down for the third round and they would ask me to play these excerpts. And I just remember like beaming because they'd say, you know, play the, the Baudinerie. And I'm just like, I cannot wait to show you how well I can play this. <laughs> And it just like, I think that joy, if you can find that, comes out in the music. And so, I don't know what the answer is. Like, how do you practice to find that joy? How do you practice in a way that you can tap into that when you need it? And I don't know. I think uh, one thing, I, through the bass grapevine, I got past Alex Hanna's some things he had typed up about his prep for when he took Chicago, I think. And one of the things he said is find the excerpts that scare you and practice them and get to know them so well that they become your favorites. And I think that is just an observation of what will happen. If you really work at the music, then you start to form a relationship and know it like a person and you know you love it for what it is. And so, I think that's maybe like an aspirational goal, like just keep working till you find yourself in that position. But.